Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Colin Patrick Ashley. Uh, thank you all for coming out today. And we're going to, we are very grateful to be able to use this space of the church in the village. And the pastor of the church would like to greet us. Give me your mic. Hi, my name is, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Wells. I'm the, the pastor here at the Church of the Village for the last four years. And uh, I know I have seen some of you from the Rise and Resist meetings that used to be held here. Um, I just want to say how how uh, glad we are to be able to host your meeting here tonight. Um, happy to have Reclaim Pride uh, meeting in this space. And as a church that, that strives to be progressive, radically inclusive, and anti-racist, I feel like we have a lot of core values in common. Um, and having, having read uh, the material that, that was, was available online, I, I know that, that we are fighting on the same side for a lot of the same things. So just wanted to welcome you tonight. Thanks for being here. And come back anytime. Good, good call on the, uh... Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you again, everyone, so much for being here uh, today. Uh, before we start, we also uh, wanted to officially acknowledge uh, that the land we are meeting on now is the ancestral, the traditional, and the contemporary lands of the Lenny Lenape peoples. Uh, we do so to acknowledge the past and the continual forms of erasure, settler co colonialism, and imperialism, including the cultural imposition of Western heteronormative social systems on the indigenous people of this land. Uh, it's important for us to speak this acknowledgement in a larger spirit of working towards continuing to center uh, the marginalized and the voices of the marginalized in everything we do. Uh, this means for us the constant work to be better in our intention to eradicate things like trans erasure, to upend anti-blackness, uh, and that our efforts to build a march that's dedicated to the liberation of oppressed people uh, means that we have to always do that space, do that work, even in our meeting spaces. Um, so I'm asking all of you to please hold that intention in your heart uh, as we meet tonight. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, so as we uh, go forward, we just wanted to uh, quickly run down our plans for tonight, our agenda. Uh, so important for us is to set the stage of why we feel it's important for this Queer Liberation March to take place. Uh, so we have speakers coming uh, to us today from international locations. We have activists who have been heavily involved in national planning and local planning. Uh, and so we have a multitude of voices who uh, tonight will remind us of why our struggle for queer liberation is ongoing uh, and why it's important that we've declared that we need uh, this People's March. Just brief statements from our guest speakers and a couple of interesting videos, by the way. Uh, then we will give you an overview of what we have done so far, where our organizing has brought us to. We'll give you a, a little history of Reclaim Pride, we will explain what committees are operating so you can uh, figure out where you want to hook up. We will update you on our negotiations and work with the Parks Department for the Great Lawn in Central Park where our big rally will be, and on our negotiations with the New York Police Department for our March route. That is an exciting moment. Uh, <laughs> and, and just give you the picture overall so you're totally read in. Yeah, and uh, we'll finish the evening with uh, some important business, uh, some discussions in terms of what it takes to pull off such a march. Uh, we'll actually have a, a time for a, a little Q&A uh, to get some feedback and input from you all. Uh, then we'll do that on a more personal level and break into smaller groups uh, so we can discuss and actually start some work towards building. Uh, the Liberation March. Uh... Yeah, and then we'll come back together for final uh, questions and answers and discussion uh, for a few minutes before uh, we finish the evening. And we hope to have all that done by 8.30 and get you out of here. 
right. and have you signed up uh, for work on specific committees. We do meet every Wednesday night at the People's Forum on West 37th Street, a lovely new meeting space, uh, which has been very generous in providing us space. And you're always welcome to come to the Wednesday night meetings or if you, and or you can work in specific committees which also meet every week on other nights. But let's start with our uh, presentations. Uh, first, a couple of videos. Uh, uh, first, we have a message from the Dyke March in Berlin. This is Dana and I'm Manuela. We organize the Dyke March in Berlin. And we also publish lesbian magazine Elmac for Germany. And we support Reclaim Pride because we think it's important to know our history. And our history is not commercialism. Our history is fighting and protesting for our rights. And that's why we march with Reclaim Pride. So let's fight together! <laughs> The women from the Berlin Dyke March will be here in June and will be marching with us. We also have a message from act an activist in Mexico. It's in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. Someone else will be translating after the video is over. It's brief. Buenas noches, soy Alonso Hernández, director de Archivos y Memorias Diversas. Es una organización que, cuyo fin es rescatar, resguardar y conservar la historia LGBTI de, de, en México y también de fomentar la difusión de la misma. Les mandamos un enorme saludo a toda, a toda esta red crítica de orgullo para que podamos hacer en el futuro muchas marchas conscientes y críticas. Do we have someone who's translating that? <laughs> this is not well organized this moment. Anyone want to volunteer to tell us what this gentleman just said? You all applauded. <laughs> Someone must have understood it. Thank Don't be shy. <laughs> ah, Gabriel, come on. Yeah, that's who. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Gabriel. I'm with Reclaim Pride. Um, he is uh, from an organization called Archivos y Memorias Diversas. That means Archives of Diverse Memories. Um, oh, you're going to play it again? Yeah, and basically what they do is they archive queer history and, um, yeah, and they promote it, basically. And so they sent a very warm um, greeting to us and they hope that uh, in the future we can put together more marches that are conscientious and very, like, morally aware and, um, yeah. <laughs> well, in fact, we got news this week that in Tbilisi, Georgia, uh, they are having their first Pride March, and they are calling it the March for Dignity because they do not feel they have a lot to celebrate there. They are still fighting the fight. So this, this is a worldwide phenomenon. We have been endorsed by 90 organizations so far around the world. Everything from uh, Congregation Beth Simcott Torah here, which has cross-endorsed us in the hot parade, and my personal favorite, the LGBT Health Center in Cameroon has endorsed the Queer Liberation Month. All right, uh, so now we're actually going to have our uh, first speaker in person, uh, Michael Igodaro. Uh, Michael, woo! <laughs> uh, brief bio, uh, Michael immigrated as a refugee to the United States in 2012 from Nigeria after being outed by a Washington Post article. In his native Nigeria, Michael was a grassroots organizer supporting homeless gay teens from a street corner in Benin City. 
He then moved on to found the first Nigerian organization to support HIV-positive gay men. Uh, since moving to New York, Michael continues to advocate for improved social systems and services for LGBTIQ asylum and refugee status seekers. His work has appeared in the Huffington Post, BuzzFeed, New York Times, and several UN news outlets. In June of 2015, he was honored by President Obama as a World Refugee Champion of Change. He has also been featured in a United Nations free and equal campaign to educate global communities about the LGBTIQ community. He is currently the program manager at AVAC, providing strategic support for HIV prevention globally while attending the New School. He's also currently co-chair, board of directors of Outright Action International, and a subject of an upcoming documentary by HBO. Michael, thank you. Hi. Oh, that was long. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Ligodaro, and I'm a gay man from Nigeria, and also living with HIV. I moved to the US of several years ago. Um, I think it's about um, seven years ago. So I think I'm officially a New Yorker. Do I get that? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think the reason why I'm speaking about um, um, Reclaim Pride, I think for me, for someone who has lived in hostile society environment before, I'm leaving my parents home at the age of 14 and been by myself ever since then, I think it's really important that pride is about the issue that we face across the globe. It's not just about you know being happy, it's not just about celebrating who we are, but it's also most importantly celebrating those who cannot be here with us, who cannot even celebrate pride where they are. In countries like Iran, like Angola, like Nigeria, where I'm from, like Uganda, like Togo, people over there cannot be themselves. They cannot be who they are. They cannot live in the streets just like they are. All they ever wanted or all they ever want is just to be safe. And I think pride, New York City, have lost that. I think it's important that we return back to our roots. What started 50 years ago, Stonewall, what's about people fighting for their lives, fighting for who they want to be, fighting to survive. And I think we need to take pride back to that. And just to say again, like, you know, I travel across the globe, especially in Africa, working with gay men, trans people, and intercess across the globe. And I think for them, you know, gay marriage is important, but what they really want or what they really fight for is survival. And sometimes that is not possible. Some of them are stoned to death, some of them have been killed, some of them are sent to jail. In my country where I'm from, it, just by being in the middle like this, you could go to jail for 14 years. Just thinking about that, not even having sex, just having a discussion or conversation about being gay or gay issue, you could go to jail for 14 years. So we need to take pride back to that. To take that in 2019, there are people who will still be killed just being who they are. There are people who will still be sent to jail just being who they are. Pride needs to celebrate that. Pride needs to bring those issues to the forefront. And that's why I'm supporting Reclaim Pride. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for that, Michael. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Bree Baker, uh, who's going to uh, focus tonight on uh, more national issues uh, in terms of uh, uh, why we should be marching. Uh, Bree Baker is a queer black millennial woman working at the intersections of race, gender, identity, public safety, and community. Uh, mentored by Carmen Perez, Bree understands that we need a multi-pronged approach to the complex problems facing society. Bree most recently served as a program and youth engagement coordinator at the Gathering for Justice and is the youngest national organizer for the Women's March on Washington. Uh, Bree Baker, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, just to echo what Michael said, it's so important that we get back to the roots of pride. And as a young person, it's really important to me that we're continuing to teach that history um, really intentionally because you wouldn't go to any of the mainstream pride marches and know the radical roots of what happened. And as a criminal justice organizer myself, um, and especially when we're looking at the 
overwhelming rates and disproportionate rates that trans women are still being killed in this country, it's shocking to me that that's not more central to the message. Um, but I'm here um, on behalf of myself as a bisexual woman and on behalf of Women's March. Um, at our 2017 Women's Convention, I moderated a panel called Not All Pussies Are Pink and Not All Women Have Pussies. <laughs> And it was, it was so important to me because I will say Women's March, we were shocked when we showed up on January 21st and saw all of the pink hats. That wasn't something we had orchestrated, but we were also surprised at again how there's this insistence to dilute a movement and to dilute a radical message. And so instead of talking about a radical unity platform that acknowledged that sex work is work and that championed for trans women and for queer women and queer people that we were focusing on genitalia again. And so as a young person, I think what's important about Pride is that we need to bring it back to the roots of commemorating the sacrifices that trans women, specifically trans women of color, have made and continue to make in this country. We need to educate that Pride is celebratory because we're celebrating our survival, but there's still so much that we're up against, especially under a Trump administration where we still are fighting to be able to use bathrooms. Um, and I mean, I am very anti-war, but to enlist in the army and to do anything that another person can do. And so um, a phrase that we often say is, I'm not free, and by Audre Lord, I'm not free while any other woman is unfree. We cannot go to these um, corporate, NYPD-filled parades when trans women are still being killed, when we're not talking about those statistics at these marches, when we're not educating young people and young queer people to know their history. So um, I'll leave you with that, but if I could ask everyone to stand up to your feet really quickly, if you can, if you are able. Um, something that I always love to end with, which is what my mentor Carmen always ends with, and um, something that I get from Asada Shakur, um, I would love for you all to repeat after me. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Now say it again so uh, Trump can hear you in DC. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Bree. Um, now, uh, our last speaker um, is an amazing activist here in New York City um, who I've worked with, uh, Key Williams. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight, Key. Uh, Key Williams is a queer, transmasculine, identified designer, writer, and public speaker, a founding member and former organizer with Black Lives Matter Global Network. The aims of Key's work is to transform global culture from the individual into a systemic analysis of structural racism. As Movement Net Lab's strategic network mobilizer, Key has helped to develop powerful conceptual and practical tools that facilitate the growth and effectiveness of the most dynamic emerging social movements of our time. As lead organizer on campaigns such as Safety Beyond Policing, Swipe It Forward, and Trans Liberation Tuesday, Key uses their platform to bring in the voices of those most marginalized by society, those who are queer, GNC, and transgender, and those living with mental illness. Currently, Key is building with the No New Jails campaign and Abolish MDC. Passionate about their city, Key invites you to check out the Black Gotham Experience, an immersive visual storytelling project that celebrates the impact of the African diaspora on New York City since 1625. Key currently serves as BGX Studios curator and a walking tour guide. Thank you so much. They kind of just told me when I walked in that like, hey, we found this great picture of you. And I'm like, mm, yeah, and then it pops up and you're like, no, no, not that one, the wrong one. Um, peace, everybody. My name is Key Williams. I use he and him pronouns. 
Um, as was just introduced, I am a founding member of the Black Lives Matter Global Network. I am also an organizer currently with No New Jails, really doing the work on the ground to um, prevent the mayor from building his jail expansion plan, um, which is gonna cost about $10 billion and will uh, build four new jails in South Bronx, Kew Gardens, Chinatown, and downtown Brooklyn if it's approved. Um, and so really that's been the work that I've been doing um, for the past six months. Um, which leads us here to reclaiming pride, right? And what does it mean to reclaim pride? What does it mean to look back on Stonewall coming up 50 years? And for me, not having anybody on the mainstream talk about our ancestors, such as Marshall B. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, our ancestors that led the way for this fight to happen and not just not just the, the pride fight and not just the way to like walk up and down the street without harassment in a particular neighborhood within New York City, right? But to actually lead movements that have led to other movements that have led to movements like mine, that have led to the Marshall P. Johnson Institute, that have led to people like Al Hearns who has built an entire network of trans folks who are working on collaborative solidarity. And what does it look like to have collaborative solidarity? It looks like actually practicing that in an every single day way. It's not just showing up to meetings when we have them once a week or once a month, but it's actually doing your work every single day. It is respecting people's pronouns. I mean, it's also an understanding that gender is much deeper than pronouns and that how we approach gender in the everyday world, the everyday society needs to go a little bit deeper. Reclaiming pride is like a super dope play on Auntie Maxine's Reclaiming My Time, which I have learned a lot about watching like, all of these investigations and stuff. Just like Reclaiming My Time is really like the safe word. You know what I mean? Like in Congress, like things get hot. It's like Reclaiming My Time, Reclaiming My Time. And I wish that for my ancestors and for our work and for the organizers, we could reclaim their time. And what that, what that looks like is reclaiming pride in each and every single way for each and every person. Um, and the disruption that has been happening in our communities is because we're focusing on singular issues and not coming together to see that all of these issues affect us all in every single way. And in order to do that, we have to build together across racial lines, across gender lines, across political lines. We have to be able to build together and have a safe New York that looks like safety without policing, that looks like keeping one another safe, that looks like not calling 911 on our community members that might be having a mental health episode, that looks like holding the door open that looks like offering a swipe in to a poor black person who might get arrested for not having $2.75. Solidarity and reclaiming pride is what we do every single day, is to have pride in ourselves, pride in our community. And so that is ultimately what I would like us to do. I would like us to build together. I would like us to talk to one another. I would like us to get invested in each other's lives and divest from the systems that are harming each and every single one of us. And so that is, for me, how I believe we should reclaim pride. And at the very, very, very core to it all is having love for one another. Um, and that is why we march, right? Thank yes. you to exactly. all of those amazing speakers. Thank you. Thank you all for the inspiration. Thank you. Quick announcement. Quick announcement. Uh, quick announcement for folks who need it. We uh, do have Metro cards available. Uh, if you need them, Gabriel, who came up here earlier and did the translation for us, in he, the back his hand, now, he's waving, waving in the his back. Hand. Um, you can see him for whatever reason you may, uh, you need a Metro card. Thank you. All right. Uh, so now we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the organizing we're doing, and we're going to start by having Natalie James explain uh, the roots of Reclaim Pride uh, and then take you through where we are now. Hello, everybody. Thank you. So just a few words uh, for people that are new to Reclaim Pride to know how this came about, how, what, what caused us to come together. Um, in 2017, in the wake of the Trump election and the Trump inauguration, 
There was a resistance contingent that marched in the 2017 Pride March. Um, and that included groups like ACT UP, it included groups like Housing Works, it inc included leftist groups, uh, dozens of groups. Um, in the months leading up to, to the 2018 march, however, the organizers of the uh, corporate pride parade here in New York, without notice and without uh, really checking in, essentially dissolved the resistance contingent and said, you can march, you can pay the fees, you can register, uh, you can march as individual groups, but no resistance cont contingent. So we weren't very happy about that, and Heritage Pride should have known better than to, uh, you know, without, without notice, dissolve a group of activists that were mar organizing together. Uh, so then we started organizing for, the, for, a couple, for several months leading up to the, uh, to the 2018 Pride March. We started organizing and discussing issues such as the hyper-commercial na nature of the march. We wanted, for instance, the uh, corporate floats to have much less emphasis, to put emphasis on community groups, on activist groups, on volunteer groups groups. Uh, we wanted um, the, uh, the police, um, you know, the onerous police presence in terms of dictating that ridiculous march route that started up, you know, and sort of looped around and ended, uh, you know, in, in basically nowhere in the 20s. We wanted uh, answers about that, and we wanted to uh, get rid of yet another uh, um, police, and, you know, instigated change, which was uh, these wristbands that, that they were asking people to wear to even participate in the march. Um, and, and by the way, this was not just limited to the Pride uh, Parade. This was also uh, uh, inflicted upon the Puerto Rican march. This was a, a, a wider uh, sort of pattern of policing of activists. Um, so in the end, um, the demands that we made uh, to Heritage of Pride were largely ignored, uh, uh, but they did allow the activists to march again together in 2018. That was a less than satisfactory experience. Um, <laughs> we, were, uh, we were left waiting for many hours next to very atrocious, in, in my, my mind, I'm editorializing, uh, house music. We were not happy with that. Um, we, we, um, we basically, by the time we started marching, uh, such critical groups as ACT UP couldn't do the community outreach they needed to do to say, you know, educate about PrEP, for instance. And then we found out that after the march that they had actually, that Heritage Pride had actually further monetized the march by selling additional participatory wristbands to corporate, uh, to corporate floats and corporate organizations that could pay for it, basically. So, yes. So, um, with, with, with that experience behind us and with Stonewall 50 in front of us, we decided we wanted to create our own march and, and have a separate vision from the corporate march that's been going on for decades, that's been alienating our community for decades. And we have since then been organizing for a queer liberation march, a people's march. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, now, Carly is going to fill us in. Carly Rhodes, come on up. Uh, she's going to give you a brief rundown of what committees are operating as we organize the march for this June 30th. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Colin. Um, so, to get ready for this June 30th march that we've now agreed to have, uh, we have several committees that we've formed to get this on the road. Um, you, if you grabbed in front, you have a paper that says, ready to jump into the work. Uh, this is sort of detailing the committees that we have as they stand. Um, so I'll just run through that. Uh, we're going to get into smaller groups later so we can talk a little bit more detail. But to give you a rundown real quick, um, we have the Access and Inclusion Committee which is dedicated to removing barriers to access at every step, whether that's barriers for um, people living with disabilities, for people um, of various other minorities, uh, poor people, people of color, we're here to include everyone and we wanna make sure that that's being talked about at all times. Um, this committee doesn't have their own meetings right now. They're sort of infiltrating every other committee. So if you are interested in getting involved, you can see the email addresses right here. We'll have more of these to pass around if you miss this flyer uh, later. The next committee we have is the Coordination and Finance Committee, which is really bringing the pieces together, uh, planning weekly meetings, making sure that everything is taken account of and ready to go. Uh, we have a weekly phone call meeting, Thursdays at 5.30 is pretty much when we um, check in. If you're interested in getting involved, again, the email is on this sheet. Our newly minted, this is our newest committee, the Fundraising Committee, um, will 
be coordinating with everyone involved to figure out how we can each be supporting fundraising for this event. Um, from house parties to foundation support, crowdsourcing, and major donors, this committee is going to be having phone meetings, again, something you don't have to leave your house to get involved with. Uh, Sundays, around 11 or 12, late morning, will be that group's meeting time. Um, next, the Media and Communications Committee, who is in charge of honing our message, getting things out there on social media, um, talking to traditional media outlets, uh, helping get the word out in any way that we can. We typically meet Saturdays uh, in Midtown. If you are interested in getting involved, please reach out via email, and we will make sure you are in the loop on the next meeting. Uh, hang in there, we have two more. The Logistics Committee is working on putting together nuts and bolts of the entire march. Look at there, they're, they're rallying over there. They're working on the rally, they're working on the march. They have a lot that they are doing. Um, please get involved with them. They usually meet Mondays, 6.30 to 8, currently on West 14th Street. This is subject to change, but please get involved and you will be in the loop on where these meetings take place. Um, and finally, we have our Outreach Committee, extremely important. This committee is broken down into several subcommittees for national, international, and local outreach, and even a tabling and postering um, subcommittee as well. This group meets every second Tuesday. Their next meeting is this coming Tuesday, April 2nd. Uh, please reach out via email if you're interested in getting involved, and they will get you there. We all need to be doing outreach in order to get these people to this march. Um, and like I said, we'll be talking more about that in our smaller groups a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And you saw the logistics committee is so enthusiastic that they cheer every time their name is mentioned. They're a lot of fun, and one or more of them are now going to explain their work with the Parks Department. I believe Huckleferry is coming up to fill us in. Um, I'm, I'm really going to keep this pretty short and sweet. Obviously, after we have our historic march up an avenue, we will enter into Central Park. We'll then traverse south to north to the historic Great Lawn, where we hope to, or where we will, join together as a community, celebrate each other in solidarity, and plan our move forward. The Parks Department, as well as the Central Park Conservancy, has been incredibly helpful and um, our allies in making this happen. We are, they have been very supportive of this as a First Amendment rally and gathering, which excites us. Obviously, this is all um, dependent on how much money we can raise. We have to be able to get people safely into that park, so we do need people to really get on board for our fundraising, and of course, we can use your help in logistics, as there's much to do much to do, and many people needed to do that work. Thanks so much, let's make it happen. Introduce me. Uh, and now, for a major update, uh, <laughs> we're having our own Ann uh, update us. And Mr. Dobbs. And, uh, and Jim uh, are going to update us on recent conversations with the police department and uh, the state of our route, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you want to go? No, sure. Sorry. In January, uh, there were four of us uh, in a room with 19 people from the police department, the parks department, the mayor's office, you name it. And uh, after a short break, we thought things were going well. Uh, one of the top people from the police department there said, we don't see a way forward for this. So we were a little crestfallen, and at, at, a, at a meeting a number of weeks ago, some folks said, don't let them do this. Uh, stand firm. Uh, so it's been a wait, and last week we got some news, which I'll let Ann Northrup Yes, uh, I've got a mic okay. here. Sorry. Um, we first submitted our permit request to the police department last October. We didn't hear from them, so we called them, and that's when the January meeting got set up. And it was extremely discouraging because we really we went in there with open hearts. 
open minds and open mouths, of course, and uh, explained very clearly and openly that we wanted to do a march that was safe and peaceful, uh, but political, and that we had no interest in interfering with the Heritage of Pride march or colliding with them or colluding with them or anything. But it had to be on Sunday, June 30th. Yes, the same and, day as that. And we wanted to touch the ground where that riot took place. So we wanted to start at Stonewall and Sheridan Square, and we wanted to replicate the original marches going up 6th Avenue, going into the park, and to the Great Lawn for a big rally. Uh, so that's what we laid out to them, and that's when they told us they didn't see a way forward because they were doing these loops with the uh, hop parade, uh, and, uh, and they were gonna be filling 6th Avenue with police vehicles, and besides, there were too many people and whatever. But we hung in there. We have a brilliant lawyer working with us, Norman Siegel, former head of the New York Civil Liberties Union. And I have to say, Norman is so moved by this that it moves me how moved he is. Uh, he keeps telling, saying to people, you know, this is the 50th anniversary. This is so important. How can people not be excited by this and moved by it? And, and his enthusiasm is really infectious. And so he's been leading us through these negotiations and talking to the police department, even after they told us they didn't see a way forward. And through several months now of negotiations, we have arrived at a point where the police department has made us an offer of a plan. And that plan is, and we thought we were going to have to start at like 110th Street and go into the park. Start assembling at Sheridan Square and 7th Avenue. We did an X. And then leave, the, leave Sheridan Square via 7th Avenue north to 23rd Street on the route that Hop will finish on, because that will be prepared and barricaded, but it's right there, it's a straight shot up 7th to 23rd. And it's a nice wide street and it holds a lot of people. Turn right onto 23rd Street, east to 6th Avenue, and straight up 6th Avenue to uh, the Crown Jewel. by this, and there, uh, we're going to get to the touchy part in a minute, but I want to tell you a couple other good things. There's a glitch. Yeah, there's a little glitch. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, the Parks Department said to us when we've been doing walkthroughs with them about the Great Lawn, uh, you're going to have to help us out with the barricading because or fencing of certain, like, emergency lanes and, and the park drives because the police department is so overwhelmed that weekend that they just don't have the resources to put the barricades in the park and have a lot of cops around. Uh. <laughs> so now the police department has said to us about the march, we don't have the resources to barricade 6th Avenue. <laughs> Massive police presence. <laughs> Catnip. Catnip. I, I, they're so easily excited. It's uh, fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a 37 second clip online somewhere of the 1970 march on this route, and it gives me goosebumps because it's it black and white and it's really pure and simple, and it was a time when gay pride was not even a thing. It's very moving, really. It makes me uh, tear up every time I look at it. And even the uh, 1994 25th anniversary march, you can find that online too, uh, Network Q coverage. 
And it shows both the main march up First Avenue, which Leslie remembers because she helped organize it, and the rogue march up Fifth Avenue. And we joined at the park and went into the park and had a rally. But again, it's people just meandering up the street. And, uh, and the police even said to us, you can take your time once you get to Sixth Avenue. <laughs> okay. So this is the offer. And we need to know from this group whether that offer is good. And there are, wait. And, right, there's a, there's a little glitch. And if we say yes or work out whatever glitches there are, uh, then there'll be another meeting to figure out all the really fine details. But this is gonna, this is gonna put a big piece of our plan into place. Yes, and I will begin to sleep again at night. So, uh, but really, uh, this is a firm offer they have made us. This is not feeling us out. This is, you are a go for this route if you want it. So here's the glitch. They want us to start uh, quite early in the morning. Well, here is, give me a second. It's really the morning, though. It, it is the morning. <clears throat> but we have to be a certain place by a certain time. And we have said to Norman and to the police department, hey, it's gay people. Get real. <laughs> but here's the deal. The hop parade starts, uh, kicks off at 26th and 5th at noon. They always kick off at noon. They will be assembling on the side streets off 5th above 26th Street and they will come down 5th, across 8th Street, down Christopher in front of the uh, Stonewall, where they will get so gridlocked that their march will take not nine hours, but nine days. Uh, and then they will go, continue to 7th Avenue and up to 23rd, which is their dispersal point. Uh, we are being asked to do everything we can to stay out of their way, which we are absolutely committed to. We do not want to interfere. We don't want to get caught up in that. Uh, we want to get out of Dodge before right. they are downtown. And of course, people can join with, if everybody keeps to their word, at any point, and they won't have to wait hours to step off. In fact, we have, uh, we have further agreed with the police department. They're fine with us if we also announce Bryant Park as a gathering point for people to uh, assemble there and join the march and come up. But with a uh, little barricading or police, people really can join the march at any point. So here's the bad news. Their first offer, or their offer, their uh, request, is that we uh, start at 9 a.m. Yeah, I knew, I knew. And, the, but the second piece of it is that we be clear of the hop route, that we make it to 23rd Street and 6th Avenue, that all of our people pass that point by 10, which means that if we leave, we step off in Sheridan Square about 9.30, we can be up there by that point. But folks have to gather at nine, more or less. So, I, I know, it's painful. Wait yes. a minute, we're not yes. through, we're not yes. through. But remember, some folks can jump in, we'll pick them up at 42nd Street. So here's the deal. I, I think we have a couple of options here. Uh, we can agree to 9 a.m. and they have actually said, uh, 9.15, okay. And we've said, really? And uh, we can agree to that. We can announce it as, say, 9 a.m. at uh, Sheridan Square, 11 a.m. at Bryant Park, uh, rally at 2 or whatever in the park. And we can show up, and as soon as we have critical mass, we can start marching up 7th Avenue to show good faith that we are marching. If people come in a little later, you know, just as long as we get everybody out of the way, uh, in plenty of time to have the, uh, it all clear for the hop march. Again, we're totally committed to that, and uh, we're not going to uh, want any stragglers interfering. The other thing we can do is we can, so that's sort of the fudging it, you know, good faith, but uh, understanding there's a little looseness in there. The other thing is that we could go back to the NYPD and say, you know, we love the route, we love the plan, we really appreciate it, this sounds good, we're happy we're working this out, but really can't we start a little later? 
Now, we can try that. There are no guarantees. They may just say no. Right. Uh, we, this is our offer. It has to be this time. Uh, no, uh, we're not messing around with that. If it helps, the 10 o'clock, we got to have everybody pass 23rd and 6th Avenue. That's two hours before HOP starts its march. So if that were to be an hour and a half or an hour, feels like it could um, build us a more vibrant marking of 50 years of uh, an amazing movement and more struggles to come. And that certainly makes sense to us, but it's also true that they don't want to take any chances of any collision of the two events. They want to build enough separation that they feel safe and relaxed. And we certainly don't want to be in a position of uh, the police getting nervous and getting itchy trigger fingers and, and you know, starting to get tough and, and start shoving people along. So I think there's a happy medium somewhere. And uh, the question is how we're going to handle this. So I'd like to let people talk about this a little. Do you want to run the mic? Yeah. Well, so go ahead. Yeah, so we're going to open this up uh, for discussion and try to get some sort of uh, group consensus on how uh, to move forward. So um, we'll, we'll have some uh, people talk or ask questions or whatever, and then we'll take a vote and see where the, what the sense of the room is. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Ramon. Um, I feel like that's a fair offer. Um, I mean, honestly, we don't want to, you know, mess up. We don't want us to go in there and say, no, we don't want this. And then they'll be like, okay, you know what? It's not happening because yeah. we know NYPD is good for that. So I feel like, I mean, I know it's kind of early. But it's a fair offer, and I think we should take it. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to know what's the ideal time for... Mike, please. Mike, use the oh. mic. I don't think I need it. I yes, you do, because we're live, we're live streaming. What will be the ideal time that you guys suggested to start the march? I'd like to know what the room thinks. Um, I don't know. I just have a question, a practical question. Um, last year, Lower Manhattan was a war zone slash desert simultaneously. Um, do we know what subways will and won't be closed? The NYPD has a habit of routing attendees on hellish paths. So like, will we be able to get off at Christopher Street? Uh, we, uh, Mr. Hum and I were at a meeting of the uh, West Side Block Associations last night where Hop was presenting, and they were asked by the Block Association people about subway uh, closures, and uh, the Hop people said that last year they were not informed about subway closures until three or four days before the event. So we don't know now, and we can't predict, and evidently that gets decided then and gets decided by the MTA or the city or whatever, and we don't have a say in that. Hi, uh, I'm Kate, and I think the nine o'clock time is fine. Okay, I do live in the neighborhood and I am an early riser, but I mean, we're getting exactly what we want on the route, and I mean, that is fantastic. So I think we all should be able to like make a little sacrifice get up earlier, and the people who can't do it, they can just jump in on 6th Avenue. So I, I'm totally with the 9 o'clock. Just a quick um, follow-up on my earlier question. Yep. Um, have they revealed where we'll be able to enter the barricaded areas? Because that's also part of the game they well, play. To be yes, TV. those okay. those are the kinds of fine points. But they're talking about us assembling on 7th Avenue and Sheridan Square right there. So, and going right up 7th Avenue from there. Now that, it will be barricaded to 23rd because that's for the hop march. But past 23rd, it will not be barricaded. That area was double barricaded last year. Was yeah, uh, that's why we're doing our own march. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, uh, before you go, Mark. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Kendall, um, and I'm coming all the way from Southeast Queens. Um. Thank you, thank you. 
And Thank so you. for those of us who live out there in the Jamaica, Rosedale, people who live further out on Long Island, to be in Manhattan at nine o'clock on a Sunday specifically, if the trains are running local, it can take over two hours. And Queens is pretty much, if you live that far out, a transit desert. So you have to take a bus to a train. And that early in the morning, there might be one train, I mean one bus for that entire hour that will be at like 5 a.m. to take you out to the train. And I think it's important that we're considerate to those people who might have had to work the night before who want to come to the event. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for coming tonight. Hi, I'm Mark, he, him. Uh, I agree. I think 9 a.m. is way too early for all the people who don't live in Manhattan. What I'd like you to propose is that we announce that we'll gather at 9.30 and we will absolutely step off at 10 a.m. I think it's much more reasonable to you know, say we promise we will get off at 10. We're going to clearly be past uh, 23rd Street, I think, by, you know, by noon, which is when they're starting. Noon's too late. S so, well, or even 11, but I think gathering at 9.30 and stepping up, because people want to be there at the start. We want to be there when we step off, and that step off time should be 10 a.m. That's what I think is much more doable for people who are up late the night before and who are coming from far away. Yeah, um, my name is Bill Ballman. Um, I remember when ACT UP had its first major protest down on Wall Street, uh, we set the time for 6.45 a.m. And being a long-term gay LGBT activist, I was like, are you crazy? <laughs> We're going to, you know, try and have a major demonstration at 6.45, 7 in the morning. But it was a major success and everyone turned out. Uh, I think we should try and push you know, a, a bit with the timing, maybe a half hour, an hour, if we can do that. But I, I think what's been done so far is terrific by you folks. And, uh, you know, let's not let time be our something we fear. Hi, my name is Jake. Um, I think this sounds about as good as we're going to get. Um, and so, and I'm, it's, very, very close to the original route, which is really what we wanted, and so I'm supportive of that. I think that whole area between Stonewall and 23rd is going to be totally locked down, so we're unlikely to get anywhere near that route if we are not playing with the NYPD. Um, as far as the time concern, I am aware of that, but I think what we should really push is, but you can just join. If you show up at 11 o'clock, join us on 6th Avenue and be a part of it. You, it may be harder to be at that original starting point at Stonewall, but that doesn't mean you can't be involved. And I think if we are strong with that message, this route can really work out. It's a long march anyway. Yeah. It's a very long march. It's a very long march, so. Hi, hi Jackie Sheher. I was, you just said a lot of what I was gonna say, Jake. Um, the glory here is that it is a long march, and it doesn't matter, I mean, most of us are not usually at Stonewall anyway, or at the beginning of the march. Uh, we, 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 you know, we've been waiting in line for four hours and then we finally you know, get a chance to join whatever it is at that point, certainly not a march. So for those who really want to be there, you know, I mean, I would like it to be 9.30ish too, a little bit later, but the best part of the march, I think, is actually gonna happen at 23rd, when we get away from 7th Avenue and all of a sudden we're fucking free and we can just take the streets like we did before, and that's gonna be the best part of the march. So whether you're coming from Queens or wherever you're coming from, you know, join us at Bryant Park, you know, be ready to do that. that. That'll be a jumping off pace. Another possibility will be 59th Street or Columbus. There'll be sev several places that'll be officially ready for people to jump in and jump on. And this is gonna be the most insane day of our lives, I think. I mean, it's gonna be fabulous, so thank you. Uh So I agree. I think if it's important to you, it really doesn't matter what time in the morning it is, you're going to show up and you're going to be there. And it's important to me, so 9 a.m. isn't that problematic, and I live in Brooklyn. I am super elated that we have this route. I think it's a huge frickin' win on our part. I 
am thrilled. I also just want to point out that this route right here only goes to Bryant Park. And if you include the stretch in Central Park, when we send people up the east and west drives, that's kind of halfway. Bryant Park is like halfway in theory. So we are talking about a rather large route. So all of this can work in our favor, obviously, if we can futz the time a little bit. But it's certainly not a make or break thing for me. I'm, I'm super thrilled. From, uh, from Stonewall to the Great Lawn is four miles. A real Stonewall march should start at 2 a.m. in the morning when the, riot, when the rebellion started. <laughs> Having said that, in terms of this serious discussion, we're, look, we're activists. We're not doing this for fun. For marches on Washington, marches on Albany, we get up at 5 a.m. and get 6 a.m. buses. That's what this is about. I mean, I'm a night owl. I don't usually get up in the morning until 9.30. But, who, you know, again, wherever you, wherever you are, just, you know, get, I'm, I'm for whatever we can negotiate uh, as uh, late as possible, but let's go. This is great. Yes, but we are marching out of anger and joy, and we need to bring both of those to this. Um, my concern is that with an early morning march, we might be excluding a lot of the uh, queer sex workers. Um, a lot of them, um, there's a lot, a, a big population that are undocumented immigrants. Uh, there are a lot of uh, trans sex workers that don't have a choice but to work Saturday nights. Um, I've organized events for trans sex workers before, trying to get them to show up early in the morning. And the only way to do that really is if they do pull an all-nighter. Um, so I, I guess I think it's a shame that we don't have that population at Stonewall where it started if it's an early morning march unless the outreach committee is willing to put in the extra work and reach out to that population to convince them of the importance and that a night without sleep isn't that bad. Thank you for that. Hi, I'm Peter. Um, I think it would be helpful if we could just get a clarification on what uh, Heritage's route is. And also, I think it is a great uh, uh, accomplishment to get the route that we've gotten. And I think starting saying that it starts at 9 and people show up at 9.30 and we leave at 10 is a very workable solution. Also, do we know how long we think we're going to march, how long the march will actually take? Well, it is uh, a four-mile march. Uh, Her Heritage of Pride last year, uh, at the request of the police department, did a horseshoe-shaped march. They started in Chelsea on 7th Avenue at about 17th Street. They lined up on the side streets of Chelsea, thereby angering all of Chelsea because they were there for hours and hours with sound trucks blaring and all of that. So, and then they came down 7th, across Christopher and t through Sheridan Square, and over to 5th and up to 29th Street on 5th, where they dispersed. This year, they're doing the reverse route, which works very well for us, but it, because it leaves 7th Avenue clear for us in the morning, because that's where they're gonna end instead of start. So they will come down fifth, we'll make this fifth, we'll come down fifth, across eighth and Christopher to the Stonewall, and then up seventh to 23rd Street, where they're actually dispersing on side streets above 23rd Street. But that they won't get there till two, three, four, five, whatever. Uh, but they're doing the 5th to 7th reverse horseshoe. We are going to go up 7th, 20, uh, 23rd, 6th. A backwards map is tough. 7th, 23rd, 6th to the park. Out of their way as soon as we are past 23rd Street. It's other people have, who haven't spoken. No, uh, we have to let other people speak first who haven't spoken. Go ahead, Roberta. 
Go. Hi, Roberta, she, her, and thank you, all of you, for doing this, because before I left, we were talking, what, Tompkins Square Park and things? This is, this is like, fabulous. This Battery is great. Park. We were talking Battery Park. Yeah, we were Park. talking Tompkins Square Park. This is fabulous. Thank you for doing this. And the time, yeah, right, who needs it? But you know what? I think it's a win, too. What concerns me a little is, what's this big thing about the two marches cannot touch each other? We're not going to throw blows at them, you know? I mean, no, come on. They're you just know? too huge and too complicated. They, they are filling the street with these corporate floats. It would be, okay. uh, it would be the worst gridlock chaos you've ever seen. We okay, must so it's just, get out of there before they arrive. It's just that. They're not trying to do, like, another number, you know what I mean? Like a sub rosa agenda. Oh, there's going to be trouble. No. No. All right. No. Uh, and Thank frankly, you. we're going to do this early. We're going to get into Central Park by like one or two, do the rally on the Great Lawn. If you want to come back to the Hop March, they'll still be there. <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. We got the cool route. <laughs> and, and they have a closing ceremony in Times Square from 7 to 10 p.m. I don't think their march will be over by then. Uh, yeah, follow... Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. Yasmina, and I'm also coming from Queens, and I'm coming from a story that takes me an hour on Sunday. So I do want to say that when people say, oh, what's the big deal, we need to acknowledge that we're not all living in the same places, we're not all traveling from the same places, and we don't all have the same income. So for somebody, it may be, you know, taking whatever uh, car some kind of car service to the city from Brooklyn and being able to afford it. And for somebody, it may be taking a bus to a train to a bus to a train. Yeah. Yeah. So just as we talk about this, it may be that we have to do 9 a.m. and that's the best we can do. But we shouldn't just be like, oh, you know, what's a big deal? And like, you know, I can be there at 9, so why can't you? So let's just kind of acknowledge that. Um, the, the you suggestion. Give, you give, uh, I, Jim, the uh, mic there, right there. The suggestion that I had is, if it has to be at 9 a.m., is that those of us who have the space and privilege to be closer maybe can offer home for people who don't have time sure. to go home. So, our siblings who do work at night may need a place to stay so maybe organizing it as part of logistics and say like hey I can offer you a place to stay so that you can get from a closer place and the second thing is to constantly um, like tweet or post things about the March Road for people who are joining from yes. like later that you don't have to spend time trying to find it that there's constant updates where right. to find so. and just hand the mic to that gentleman right there I've got a Okay, Amanda first and then Jim. Amanda, she, her. Um, I was actually going to say pretty much exactly um, what um, my sister over there said. Um, Thank you, Amanda. You're very welcome. <laughs> no, but, um, um, yeah, also, just, just re remembering about the time, I, I'd like us to at least, I feel like there's a real push for the 9 a.m., but I'd like us to, to agree to really push for the the latest that we can get, um, and only and only pull back when they say, well, then you know, screw you, you can't have the route. Um, because no, I don't think they'll do that, but I I can't guarantee that they'll uh, give okay. us any leeway. But, but just yeah. also just to underscore the the folks that um, that we're really building this march around, and the people that we want to rise up. Um, and I'll go out on a limb here and say, you know, folks of color, low income, we're not living in lower Manhattan. Uh, many of us aren't even living in Manhattan. It is a Sunday. You've got slow trains, slow buses. Plus, we don't know when the MTA, what, which subways are going to close. So add that onto the fact that you may get up at five in the morning and you arrive in Manhattan and the only place you can get out is, you know, uh, 33rd Street on the east well, that side. that may be the ideal place to join, but yes. Thanks. Uh, my name is Jim Forat. I was at Stonewall, and I was part of the planning for the first march. I want to say congratulations, Anne, and all the people that negotiated this and Bill. Um, I think we got a really good deal, and that we have open streets 
is critical to me. These barricades are just monstrous. And I'm very sympathetic to the people that don't live close enough, but the fact that you got Bryant Park as a staging area, we should tell people to come. If they can't be at the beginning of this march, they certainly can come join us at, at Bryant Park. And we're not going to, as I understand the plan, we're not going to take off till we have a sizable crowd that we welcome right. people in. So I think that they have done an excellent job of planning a route. Um, I don't trust the cops. So I want to, in writing, I want, to, I want to make sure that they don't renege on themselves. I want the politicians on city council to stand up and s congratulate the police department for giving us this route. I don't want any switching on the day that it happens. No, I don't and I trust so. both of you yeah. are strong enough and bold enough and tough enough that you can get those city politicians, <laughs> those that are gay and those who are not gay, who support this. Um, I think so. I'm not for attacking the other march. And I think we should really stop talking about the other march. Um, I'm hoping to go to both of them later. This one I'll go to first. But th I think that we, we really should concentrate on what we're doing and why we're doing it. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think I, I, we could talk more, but I think it's time for us to get a sense of the room. I've just had a new idea. How about if we have a pop-up Stonewall Inn in Bryant Park? And you could pretend you were at the Yes, Stonewall. then you could say you're starting at the Stonewall. More, more seriously, should we push, yeah. should we push for a little more time? <laughs> or take it as is? Uh, I don't have a mic. We, they we, took all the mics. I'm sorry, Andy, we need to okay. uh, move should on. Should we push for more time yeah. or take this as is? All right, so we're going to take a vote. Vote for, uh, you can vote for both if you're okay with both. Uh, but we'll vote on uh, accepting the 9 a.m. start, understanding we may fudge it a little, or pushing for another half hour to an hour. I don't know what category it fits under. Uh, the part that we, we can push the part, the moon, it's not so much the start time, it's where we have to be. We have to clear 23rd and 6th Avenue by 10. Right. We could try and budge that All right. back. How many, how many, we're going to vote on pushing, but how many are willing to accept, if necessary, 9 a.m.? Thank you. Uh, how, how many are not? Thank you. All right, good. That's good. That's a good base. Now, how many would like us to try to push it a little later? I think that's the same number. All okay. right. Okay. Okay. So right. we'll try for an hour. We will. We and will. we might get something. All right. If not, this deal is good? Yes. Okay. say, but we have a lot more to do in this meeting, so we have to cut this off. Feel free to come to our Wednesday night meeting, 7 to 9 p.m. at the People's Forum on West 37th Street. Um, and speaking of our meetings, can I ask a show of hands for all those folks who are here for the first time or here at a Reclaim Pride meeting? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please make sure we have your email addresses before you leave tonight. Um, so uh, a bit more business is, as folks see, this takes a lot to put together. Um, uh, talking about all of the nuts and bolts, we actually have uh, Leslie and Jay, who've been doing a lot of works on logistics and planning, uh, and they're just going to go over a few more nuts and bolts things for, for everyone. Do we still have, oh, there's the other microphone. Hey everybody, I'm Jay, I use he, him pronouns. How many people in this room are super, super, super excited about doing this march and this rally? How many people in this room are excited to join in with the work that we're doing? Okay, we're here to tell you how you can do that. I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie. Hi, <clears throat> thank you, hi everyone. 
Somebody earlier made some reference to the uh, work of the Outreach Committee. I think it was you. Um, yes, we have an Outreach Committee. But um, I think if we actually think about the task at hand and what we're trying to do here, and that what we're trying to do is turn out large numbers of people from our many, the many parts of our communities, and we're trying to send a strong, coherent, clear, powerful political message. Uh, this is a heavy lift, right? We want to change not just what happens on one day at one march. We want to change the character of this movement. <laughs> so this is not a job to be left in the hands of one committee, one outreach committee. All of us have to be part of the outreach work. It's as simple as that. As I have said in organizing other demonstrations in the past, there are three critical elements to organizing a demonstration. Outreach, outreach, outreach. <laughs> All of planning is critically important. And I think we have a good plan for what we want to do that day. But if we don't tell people about it, then you know, it'll be a nice plan, but we won't have that show of force that we know at this moment for our communities, for our movement, and I dare say for this country, we need a strong and powerful statement. So uh, it's a very simple proposition. The question is, what can each of us do? How can each of us, without joining the Outreach Committee, although everyone is welcome to join that committee, to help, and that committee helps us get organized in how we do the outreach, but whether or not you join any committee, there are many things that each of us can do as individuals and as parts of and connected to all the various organizations and groups and entities that we interact with. So I want to call your attention to two documents that we handed out, and hopefully everybody has them. One is, sorry, can you hold this? <laughs> One is, is uh, ready to jump into the work. Did everybody get this? Okay, great, keep it with you, take extra, share it with other people. This lists all the committees that you can join, uh, that has the details of the Wednesday night meetings, uh, a reminder about money, etc. The other document is this pledge form. Did everybody get that? This is a simple mechanism which you're gonna talk about a little bit more when we break into small groups. A simple mechanism to help us know what you're going to do and how you're gonna plug into this. It is absolutely critical that we find a way to use our own energy, our own resources, our own tools and our connections that we figure out how to use all of that toward our common goal of making this the most powerful day possible. And let's not kid ourselves. It is a lot of work, right? We have got to, we have three months to pull this together. A tremendous amount of groundwork has been laid. We have a strong foundation and now we have to build the first floor, the second floor, the third floor. We have to move from first gear to second gear to third gear. We need everybody's involvement in that. And it can be done. And let me just say one more thing before I turn it over to, to Jay. Um, I, I don't want to be in a situation, I don't know about any of you, but I don't want to run into an old friend on uh, the day after this, who says to me, wow, that sounded like a really great march. If I had known about it, I would have been there. 
<laughs> we want everybody to know about it before it happens and know that we want them to be part of it. So really the heart and soul, the backbone, in fact, all of our body parts of this whole operation is what each of us figures out what we can do to get the word out, to organize people, to pull the energy that we know is out there in our communities to gather that together and bring people together for the, what I hope will be, and I believe we have the potential to make it, a truly historic moment for our movement. Thank you. Well. Okay, so like Leslie said, we have a ton of work to do. We, we, what'd you say? Yeah, I know, I know, Eric, I'm about to do that. Don't rain on my, my whole sort of lineup here. So eager. Um, we've got a lot of stuff to do. We're gonna need folks in every cohort that's in this room to reach out to all their communities, like Leslie said. We need you to use your, your social media. We need you to reach out to your friend groups any way that you can, your family. One of the biggest things that we have to do is raise money. Tonight we need to raise a little bit of money to pay for this beautiful space that the Church of the Village has given us. So Colin's gonna end, Philip are gonna hand out bags. If you can give, if you can give two dollars, give two dollars. If you can give 50 cents, give 50 cents. If you can whip out your checkbook and give hundred thousand dollars, by all means do that. And we'll use that money for the march. But um, everything, beyond the cost of this space will go toward the march and the rally. But we are going to have to do a lot of fundraising over the course of the next, really the next few weeks especially, but over the entire course of the next three months until the march happens. Um, if we, we have a really great plan for what we want to do in the park, um, the march itself won't cost that much. Okay, there's not a whole lot that we need for the march. The, mar the march costs, we actually already have covered with the money that we've raised already. We've already raised about $40,000 uh, in-house. We got a great $25,000 donation from Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. We're working with a couple of other foundations on gifts of that same size. We've gotten a few private donations uh, in the six-figure realm. So we, are, we have moved forward somewhat. Now that we're coming to fruition with our plans to march and with the, with the NYPD to actually get our march permit, that will help us finalize our parks permit. We will be seen as something that is really happening. That will help us raise more money. That will help us increase our outreach. But right now, until we get that, until we get that far, we need folks to really think creatively about raising money. There are all sorts of ways that we can raise money. If you go to the reclaimprideNYC.org uh, website, there is a donate button that people can just use that to donate. It's, uh, it's through our, our fiscal sponsor, which is Housing Works. They are funneling all our money. Can, yeah, give Housing Works a hand. They, they really, they stepped up right at the beginning. They are our fiscal conduit. It's under their, we are operating under their 501c3 status which means that anyone that you speak to about donating money, every cent of the money that they donate to this effort is fully tax deductible. So they will get, they'll be able to write it off next year. And Housing Works is not taking a penny, which is very unusual for a fiscal sponsor. Yeah. No cut for Housing Works. So you, yeah, usually a fiscal sponsor will charge a percentage of what your donations are, so it's really great. Um, we also, through Housing Works, have set up uh, a, a, um, a system with their fundraising software, which is called Classy, which if any of you work in nonprofits, you've probably heard of it because they're soliciting everyone. Uh, through Classy, we can make personal fundraising pages that we can connect to our social media so that you can do your own sort of crowdfunding campaign through that, uh, through that website. Um, uh, so that you can reach out to your friends throughout all of your social media. Um, but there's nothing, 
you know, there's nothing like the personal touch. Uh, we're all in this sort of social media age where we're all kind of separated by a screen, but there's nothing wrong with making a phone call. In fact, everything is right with making a phone call, with, with sending a, a group email like we used to do back in the day out to your friend groups or to, to your, your, your friends from college, your friends from high school, your friends from this club or that club or this organization or that organization. Um, but that is really, really important. We need to raise a lot of money. If we are able to do everything that we want to do for this and make it as, as, as big a splash as possible, we could probably do everything for about three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand dollars. We're about an eighth to a tenth of the way there but that's still a lot of money to raise. So we have a fundraising committee. I'm on the fundraising committee. You can see me after when we break into small groups to, to talk about that. Um, but please, uh, on your sheet, if, you're, if you have any background in fundraising, uh, if, you are, um, if you have rich friends, if you have any rich friends, uh, or uh, if you know of any good foundations that donate to LGBTQTSIA causes, please, please, please see us. Okay, thanks. Uh, one minute from Carly on social media. Yes. <laughs> Hi, so thank you, Jay. Thank you for bringing up social media. Um, I'm just here to let you all know, if you have Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, please go up. You can, If you can pull out your phone right now, please do. Follow us at, all right, wait for it, Reclaim Pride NYC. I know you can all remember that. Reclaim Pride NYC on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Follow us, uh, retweet, share anything, encourage your friends to follow us. That's how one of the ways we're gonna get the word out there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. I remain committed to ending this meeting at 8.30, so hang in there just a few more minutes. Uh, f we set this time aside for Q&A. Uh, we can certainly take a couple of minutes to, if anyone has any burning questions or uh, wants to discuss anything. Jean, hold on. Hi, uh, my name is Jean Fedorka. Well, I just have a question. Are there going to be vehicles available at the start of the route for the elderly and the disabled? Yes. We have fielded a number of requests, uh, for instance, from original members of the Gay Liberation Front and other people with various uh, disabilities or people who just don't want to march four miles. And we are working on uh, acquiring vehicles to transport people the length of the march if they cannot walk it. And, uh a quick announcement, uh, some of our members of our accessibility and inclusion committee have already decided working on potential shuttle buses uh, from different neighborhoods or boroughs to get folks uh, here the morning of, right? So they have started that conversation already. That was based quick, on, wasn't it? <laughs> based on your feedback, yes. Um, so great news. Andy? And also yeah. our website. Has the, has the uh, bag gone around to anybody, everybody? <laughs> I'm Robert on logistics, and also our website will be filled with up-to-date information on subway closings, on accessibility information. So those of you who do need accessibility um, assistance, please make, make sure that you utilize the website. Uh, the other thing yes, is that... contact us to let us know what you need so we can be sure to deal with that. And the other thing is that on the Great Lawn itself, to pull this off, going in from uh, Central Park South to the Great Lawn, which is between 79th and 86th Street, we're going to need approximately 250 volunteers. And so anyone who who's, has expertise in that, people in the logistics committee, raise your hand. Um, talk to some of us in the logistics committee to see how we can reach out to organizations to get those, that number of volunteers. All right. Uh... Hi, I'm Andy Velez, um, along with several other people. Along with several other people who are here tonight, I'm a founding member of ACT UP. And um, I want to say it's still a shock to find the police being cooperative. I'm, 
I, like, huh? Well, they did start by telling us they didn't see a way yes. forward. Well, you know, they are what they are. But I want to say big thanks to Ann and Bill for their work. And Leslie. Leslie and was Leslie also a negotiator. For, be, for making it. And Norman Siegel. Making it move up to this point. Um, this is, uh, would have been undreamed of even a few years ago. So I, while I respect the things that individuals have mentioned as difficulties, we're queer. We do things. We make things happen. So let's just have a great time pulling this together. Hi, I have uh, two things I want to say. I know I'm not going to be able to make the march all the way from Stonewall to uh, the Great Lawn because of my neuropathy. So let's make sure that we have a lot of flyers saying gather here, and specific, and not just Great Lawn, but what street do we go to? 72nd Street? You know, exactly where people who, I'm going to get in the subway and go up and meet you guys up there at some point. So let's make sure it's very clear. 86. If you want to get up, where you get off and where you meet. And secondly, Anne, could somebody give the people here a little impression of what we're thinking about for the rally? I know we haven't nailed it down, but what we think the rally is going to look like exactly, so they have an idea. Okay. Robert. We're thinking of a rally, three and a half, three, three and a half hours, uh, to have a mix of moments where everyone comes together with um, maybe about five or six musical performances and 30 or 40 speakers that represent uh, age, gender, race. No, too many, Leslie? 20? Anyway, a, a, mix, a, a mix of, and then, and then film clips. Five. <laughs> All right, let's move on to uh, having little chats among ourselves about how we want to get involved, what we want to do. So I'm going to ask you to, like, uh, turn, uh, yeah, like, turn around and talk to the people in the row behind you, each half few. Make sure to introduce that four or five of us. Does anyone have any, we want to just come together for a minute to see, does anyone have any uh, questions or statements or anything at this point? As you leave, and I want to beg. as you leave, there are stacks of palm cards on the table outside. Take a stack of palm cards. I just gave one to a woman who works at an HIV clinic for Mount Sinai. She is going to put the stack of cards on the desk there at the clinic. You have places in your life that you can hand out these palm cards. Everybody take a stack and start publicizing and doing outreach for this march. Talent. And uh, on that note, so you've heard us mention uh, over and over in this meeting how important outreach, outreach, outreach is. Um, all of our committees are important and uh, you signed up in the way in, but you can also, there are people walking around with clipboards, uh, assigning you up directly to some of our committees and subcommittees. On each of the tables out, out back, we have specific sign-up sheets for a lot of things that are outreach-based. So we're going to be doing a lot of tabling in parks. You can sign up for that, get to meet people, sit down at a table in a park, and just hand out palm cards. We have events we're going to in the next few weeks, uh, meetings. Uh, folks are 
are also gonna pass out palm cards in Chelsea Black, Black Party Weekend. Uh, if that sounds interesting to you, sign up for events and outreach. Uh, we also need help reaching out to organizations, so there are lists out there uh, in terms of any organizations that you think we need to reach out to, let us know. So please check out those outreach tables, please talk to the folks with the clipboards, um, uh, and they will sign you up to specific committees as well. Uh, I've just heard that we raised $496 tonight. Woo! Some of that will go to the church for the use of the space, and whatever is left will go to build Reclaim Pride. Thank you all for coming tonight. Take palm cards, come to our Wednesday night meetings, sign up for a committee, do outreach, build the march. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.